Thank morning. You. Another morning. God bless you. God bless you. It's time to get started. Now today, uh, hopefully, if you looked at the first question already, what is religious enough, I'm hoping your mind is twisting all up. I did that on purpose. Uh, we're going to get there. But uh, we want to start off by having a prayer. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves for you now because we know we know us. We know that, that without Jesus and his blood, we're never good enough. We pray that you always guide us, that you give us strength, that we choose the right path. We pray that you be with the ones that would love to be here that, that can't because they're sick or whatever. Uh, that's keeping them away. Uh, we pray that you be with them and help them to overcome. We pray that you be with the ones that don't want to be here, uh, that have chosen not to be here, whether Satan has uh, twisted their thinking or whether things have happened in their life where they think they can never be forgiven. We pray that you, you help them to, to understand that, that you forgive everything. We pray that uh, you help them to understand that, that this is where they need to be. We pray for the ones that, that are, are listening. Uh, we pray that you be with them, give them peace and, and comfort if they're having any medical issues. We pray that you be with the doctors that are, that are serving them. We pray that you always help us to be a shining light. That's the choice. We pray that you help us always bring your name honor and glory in how we act, how we speak. As we study, we pray you help us learn something new, something exciting. Thank you, God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, for the ones that haven't been here for all these lessons that we've been doing for all these weeks, uh, we'll read some of the scriptures in the first part for these first four sentences of fill in the blank. We won't read all of them, but we will read some of them. And we'll start off with John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and keeps them or does them, I liken him as a wise man. And then let's go to Matthew, uh, not Matthew, let's go to 1 John 1, verse 7. 1 John 1, verse 7, and then we're going to get started. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. We're going to go on a journey today, and we're going to try to figure out religious. We're going to try to figure out how we're supposed to be. We're going to try to figure out how we're supposed to act. We're going to try to figure out how we're supposed to choose things and hopefully get a good answer to the last question that I have down here. This is the journey I want us to go on, and uh, so let's get running. John was trying to help people understand what it was like to follow Jesus, follow God's Word. So let's go to John chapter 3, excuse, uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 3, verse 7 through 20. John is baptizing, and people are coming to him. Now he sees... All kinds of people, but let's, let's hear what he calls them. It's kind of weird. He, he thinks they're animals uh, or, or uh, things like that, but let's, let's listen. They said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. 
And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Jesus talks about this a lot. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. That's a new thought. Just kidding. That's the way it ought to be. They only take what they're supposed to take. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. Now, as the people were in expectation that all reasoned their hearts about John, whether he was a Christ or not, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winning fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. John is just preparing them. John was the voice crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. When they asked him, what shall I do? The tax collectors asked. He said, don't take more than you're supposed to. Take what's been allotted to you. The Romans, they would say, this is how much you've got to pay. This is what I want you to pay. And then anything else you, you take is yours. But he said, this is what you should take because that way you'll have something to survive on. Many of the tax collectors took more. So that's why John says, only take what's allotted to you. Then also the soldiers asked, well, what should we do? And that's when he said, well, don't intimidate people. He doesn't say it. Don't take bribes. He don't say that. He said, don't intimidate people. Be honest and do what's right. Boy, ain't that a thought. Do what's right. It's surprising that we have to be told that. We have to be told to do what's right. Ah. Oh. Man, Jesus, though, Jesus was, he was, he was a little bit, uh, he was many times uh, very straightforward. Let's go ahead and go to Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Did not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one little uh, tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now the Pharisees and the scribes and Sadducees, but the Pharisees and scribes especially were supposed to be the uh, religious people of this time. They were, they were us. Uh, you know, they, they went to the synagogues, they went to uh, all that, and, and they studied and, and learned about God. They were supposed to be in the know. They were supposed to be Right. They were supposed to know the answer if you had a question and wanted to know what you needed to do. They were supposed to be in the know. These are the ones that Jesus says, if your righteousness does not exceed theirs, and let me change that, your righteousness must exceed theirs. 
And they were supposedly the righteous group. They were supposedly the righteous ones. And everybody else wasn't. But Jesus says, unless your righteousness is greater than theirs, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's go to Matthew 15, verse 1 through 20. An interesting thought here. Then the scribes and Pharisees who, who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat, when they eat bread. He answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God? Because of your tradition. For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God, then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. When he called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then his disciples came to him and said, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended? When they heard this saying, but Jesus answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into the ditch. Then Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. And Jesus said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. What is Jesus trying to get a point? What is he trying to say here to his, to his apostles? What is he trying to say? What comes out of the heart, not what they eat, or whether their hands are clean, it's how they live and what they have in their hearts that matters. That's right. It says, not what eating with unwashed hands, what matters is what comes out of the mouth, because that's coming out of their heart. Uh, did I say it, paraphrase that? It? Paraphrase that right? Close? Did I paraphrase that right? Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Fifteen? Yeah. What number was when I asked him? When Peter asked about explaining the parable? In the 19th verse. 19th verse? Uh, that's talking about what comes out of the heart. Though. That's when we speak. You know, like what I'm doing right now, I stop, I talk. Well, see, when the words that I allow to come out of my mouth, that is what is in here. That's an idea. Right. So that's what defiles a man. It's not what you put in, but what comes out. What comes out. What comes out. That's right. All right, let's go to... Uh, I don't want to go too fast, but I do want some time on this latter end. So let's go ahead and go to uh, Matthew 12, verses 1 through 8. Matthew 12, verses 1 through 8. Jesus does try to teach the Pharisees every once in a while. 
but he's not always um, successful. At the time, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the shoe bread, the show bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Let's, uh, let's see what he kind of means by I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Let's go to 1 Samuel Chapter 15, verse 22. What has happened here? Saul came back from wiping out the Amalekites like he was supposed to, but he didn't do everything that he was supposed to. And this is uh, what Samuel said to Saul when he did that. So Samuel said, uh, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? As in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. Jesus is trying to tell these Pharisees it's better to obey. It's better to follow his commands. It's better to do what's right than to sacrifice and dot all your T's and everything. It's better to do what's right. And Mark chapter 3. We're going to see Jesus. Now he's, he gets a little upset here. He has a lot of dealings with the Sabbath because they had such a, a stickler about the Sabbath. But true, if you read... The uh, Old Testament, and I forgot if it was in Deuteronomy or somewhere, someone was killed for not obeying the Sabbath. They, they took him out and stoned him. Uh, but that's a whole different lesson. So, let's go start with verse 1. And he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Step forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other, then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodian, Herodians against him how they might destroy him. In the different readings here that I, I, I didn't choose the other readings because the reason I chose this one because Jesus, uh, on this one, Jesus looked around and he was angry. And, you know, and he was angry because of the hardness of their hearts. He asked them, is it, the question was, is it lawful to do good or evil on the Sabbath? Is it better to save life or kill on the Sabbath? And they would not answer. And Jesus was grieved, and he was angry. He was angry about the hardness of their hearts. And so Jesus healed him. And then they plot to kill him. Sometimes our friends are not going to receive what we have to say any better. 
Sometimes uh, I, tell, I tell people you don't want to know. They'll ask me uh, about something, uh, about something they did. has nothing really to do with the scripture, and I'll say you don't want to know. And, and I'll tell them that because they don't, I know they don't want to know. And, and I've only had once or twice that they pressed me until I told them, and then they really didn't want to know. But if I say you don't want to know, you might want to just let it go. But uh, these Pharisees, their hearts were hard. Let's go to uh, Luke 19. Micah 6 8. fingers don't want to let me do the walking. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. God wants us to do what's right. God wants us to choose right. God gave us a gift, and the gift he gave us was choice. We choose whether we want to do right. We choose whether we want to do wrong. We have that choice. The Pharisees had that choice. Let's answer these questions here. But let's read the scriptures before we do. The question is, how can we be more righteous than the Pharisees? Let's read these scriptures, and that ought to help us with that. Matthew chapter 16, verses 5 through 12. Now when his disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, Is it because we have taken no bread? But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have not brought, that you have brought no bread? Do, not, do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the five of the five thousand? And how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many large baskets you took up? How is it you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? But to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In chapter 23, verses 1 through 5. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to do, to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works. For they say, and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi, but you do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ. And you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for the one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, 
For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering in to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much the son of hell as yourself. Woe to you blind guides who say, Whoever swears by the temple is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is uh, obliged, to, obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar is nothing, but whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is ob obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it, and whoever and all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it, and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God, and by him who sits on it. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! You pay a tithe of mint and a nice and common, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel hoe. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgement. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside then may be clean also. Just a little bit further. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Let's stop there. Jesus was, uh, I call it, uh, Pharisee bashing. He tells it like it is. And if you look at this, look at this, and let's make sure it's not us. Let's make sure that, that our inside is just as good as our outside. The Pharisees had gone through and they wanted to know just how religious to be and, and not be too religious. That's the way I'm going to say it. They, they, wanted to, they wanted to know how far they had to go to make it. So they made up all these different traditions that weren't really laws trying to explain how far to go. And then they start obeying these traditions more than the laws and they had done such a poor job of it they, they messed it up where the traditions were breaking the law. And what they were doing was saying what they had added was more important than what God had said to begin with. That's right. They were doing what they had added. They thought what they added was better than what God said. That's right, Billy. But that ain't the way it is. Anytime we start adding to the Word, anytime we start changing it because we don't like what it says, we're messing up because God don't change. God don't change. So how can we be more righteous than the Pharisees? How can we do that? How can we be more righteous than the Pharisees? Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds the Pharisees' righteousness, we won't go to heaven. So how can our righteousness exceed theirs? Yes. Don't listen to false teachings. Don't listen to false teachings. That's one. That's right. Well, how, how else can we have our righteousness 
to exceed the Pharisees' righteousness. How about... Love others. What? Love others. I'm sorry? Love others. Okay, no, uh, One more time. Others. Love others. That's where I was going. I love that. Love others. Love others more than ourselves. Yes. Yeah, serving God instead of the devil. Okay, yeah. What we want to do for our righteousness to exceed the Pharisees is do what's right. Don't make up stuff on our own and say, well, God really didn't mean that. No, God meant it. God meant it. And God has always meant it. Amen. Always. God says it, he means it. End of story. So, for our... See, the Pharisees, what they did, they added to the word, and then they, they lived it out and thinking it was okay. <coughs> we got to be careful not to do the same thing. Right. We got to be careful because there's a lot of things we like, and that's Okay. But there's a time and place for everything. Amen. Ecclesiastes Amen. 3 tells us that. Amen. There's a time and place for everything under the sun. I like music. I like, I like uh, bands. I like all that stuff. But there's a time and a place for that. There's a time and a place. Worship. Anything other than what God has said to do and worship... <coughs> It's not the time or the place. You only do what God says, not what I want. There's a lot of things I like, but I also understand Scripture, and I understand that there's a time and a place for everything. Amen. So number six, what is the right question? First of all, what is religious enough is not the right question. It's not even asked right. How can I please God? How can I please God is a better question. That's right. I did that on purpose. We can never be religious enough. <laughs> it ain't happening. I did that on purpose because we don't need to be worrying about being just enough. We want to be worrying about doing what's right. We want to be worrying about pleasing God. We want to be worrying about being right with God, Amen. not with men. Amen. So I chose just a few scriptures. I like yours. I like that. Let's do it right with God. When we study, we don't need to be studying. Now, how can I justify this thing? No! We need to be studying, what does God say? We need to be understanding, what does God say about this? I don't know. Not how can I justify what I want to do. We get it wrong a lot of times. Because we study the Bible because we want to justify what we do. I got news for you. <laughs> you can twist the Bible any way you want to justify whatever you want to do, but you ain't going to be right with God when you do that. So, what is the right answer? How can I please God is a great answer. Let's go to Mark chapter 12. We're going to start off with verse 28, or right in that area. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceived that Jesus, he had answered them well, asking him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart 
with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. The second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. Jesus said to this man, You are not far from the kingdom of God when he heard that answer. And then one more place. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 6. It's one of my favorite stuff. Isaiah chapter 6. And we're going to go through only part of what goes on here. Uh, Starting with uh, verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken from, with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. And he said, Go and tell this people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. The part I wanted you to see about this the most was when Isaiah realized that his sin was purged and The Lord needed someone to go. He said, here I am. Me. Me. Send me. He didn't feel worthy enough before his sin was taken away. Our sin is taken away by the blood of Jesus. When we're baptized, we die. We die to ourself. And then when we come out, we're a new creature. Our sin is purged then. We have no sin at that point. And when God sees us, he sees Jesus' blood. That's why I really like uh, walking in the light, 1 John. But when Isaiah realized that his sin was purged and he was clean, And the Lord asked for someone to go. He said, here am I. Send me. Our sin has been purged. Let us have the same enthusiasm and say, here am I. Send me. Don't send somebody else. Send me. Let me do it. Let's have a prayer, and then we'll be done for today. Dear Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves for you because you know us. Nothing is hidden from you. We pray that in everything we do and how we live and how we act, we bring honor to your name. We pray that in everything that you touch our hearts, that we choose you because it is a choice. We pray that you always help us because sometimes that choice is hard. Sometimes it's not. We pray that you bless everybody and touch their lives. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. There's no way we can ever repay you for not only sending but allowing Jesus to come and die for us. But thank you. 
We pray also as we live out our lives that people don't, don't really see us. They see you living in us. Thank you, God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.